morning. It is good to be back. Uh, last Sunday, I was in Iowa, first of all. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but it was good to be there. Well, my daughter lives there now, so I got to be nice what I say. Uh, I was, was great, and uh, seeing my son-in-law as well, and getting to watch them minister there uh, at their church, uh, just, you know, proud uh, mom and dad moment to get to be there uh, with them and be a part of that. Um, earlier in the week, so like uh, I think I mentioned to you uh, two weeks ago when I preached that uh, like I preached and then took off from here and went to the airport and got on a plane and flew to Phoenix. Everybody's been talking about, oh, you're so lucky. It was so warm there. Uh, it wasn't warm there. It was a lie. I don't know what they're telling you out there, but uh, Man, one morning, Susan, first of all, Susan is a power walker. You know, like Pat warned me. He says, if you go out with her walking, it's more like running. And he was right. Uh, she, kept me, she kept me going. It was 23 degrees, though, when we left. And Globe is, is a little bit higher elevation, obviously, than, than Phoenix. But still, um, I, I was actually thankful to be walking that fast because I worked up a sweat. But uh, just had a great time. Uh, they're in in uh, Phoenix with them as well, and man, I, I just encourage you to be to continue to be praying for them. Um, the spiritual battle that they're facing uh, on a daily basis. It was amazing uh, to go to the Apache Reservation. We went to two different places and just got to see the work that was going on there. And uh, the battle is is real. Um, first guy that came into the place where, where they're serving uh, w said, uh, I almost didn't come today for my for my meeting with, with Pat because uh, I had a dream last night that I died. And, uh, um, I, and I was like, wow, wow. Uh, what's going on there he's like well i've been taking my family back to church and uh we haven't been to church in years and uh just but yet there's all these other things that are going on in my life and he was scared for his life literally and so um it was that just happened over and over again and talking to people about the things that they're hearing the things that they're seeing and then as we, i talked with pat and Susie, and, and then also there was a they have another missionary there with them. Her name's Julie. You got an email concerning Julie this week, um, and uh, she was in the hospital. So uh, just just be praying for them, um, the, the attacks that they're facing, and that 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 uh, they need encouragement and they need our our prayer support as, as they wage that battle each and every day. So it was great to see them, but it's also good to be back and uh, excited to look into. Uh, into scriptures uh, this morning. We're going to continue on in Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verses 25 to 28. There's a Bible there in your row. By the way, those Bibles, they're there for you to keep if you don't have one. So in the front of it, it says this Bible is for you to use here, or if you want to take it home with you, or you know somebody who needs a Bible, we're giving you a Bible to give to them. That's, that's what they're there for. We believe that as God's Word is, is not only taught, but also read and given away and, and examined, that His Holy Spirit works, and, and that He works through His Word to teach us. And so um, take out one of those blue Bibles, follow along with us. It's page 949 uh, in, those, in, those, in those Bibles. Would you bow your head and just ask the Lord uh, to speak to us, um, speak through his word and uh, meet us in our place of need. Heavenly Father, I pray for Pat and Susan, uh, for Julie that are ministering there in the in, in Globe and in the Apache Reservation, I think of our 10 or so other missionaries that are serving around the world. Lord, uh, the spiritual battle that is being fought every day is real there. And it, also, Lord, we know that it's, it's real here. It, it, Heavenly Father, as, as we study this morning, we're going to be talking about strongholds. And Lord, the, the places where we've given opportunity uh, for Satan to have Satan to have access into our lives and to influence us and to, and to, uh, and to bring us down. Lord, you, you said that you've given us victory, uh, not in anything that we can do, but Lord, in, in, what, in what you've done on the cross, the fact that you rose from the grave. Uh, we, can, we can stand in confidence and, and, and go against those battles. And so, Lord, uh, teach us this morning. Uh, may, your, may your spirit show us the things that, that you would have for us. 
And Lord, we want to live in victory. Um, not only the day, Lord, that we gave our life to you, but also, Lord, we want to live in victory each and every day as we follow after you, as, as we allow your spirit to guide us. And so teach us this morning. Uh, we want the eyes and ears of our heart to be open to the things that you have to say to us. I ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor J.L., um, last week, uh, began our, uh, the verses that, that we looked at as far as Christian living. Because if you remember, uh, in chapters 1 through 3, uh, it was laid out who we were called to be. The things that, that we were called to be as we trusted in God's Word, as God's Word sp uh, speaks to us, uh, that we would be people that are, that are used in, and changed by, by His Word. And what we see here, as Paul was talking to the church there, is that many of them had a hard heart. It says that they had lost all sensitivity to what was right and what was wrong. Other places in Scripture, it talks about the fact that we even go so far in our humanness to invent evil. We're looking for new ways to do what we want to do. And Paul says that's not the way that it should be. When we give our lives to Christ, if you're a disciple, if you're a Christian, if you've given your life to him and you're saying, I'm trusting in him for salvation rather than in myself, it says that the, the old is gone. The, the old self is to be gone and instead it's replaced with the new self. That we're, it's like taking a coat, one coat off and putting another coat on. As we go about living our life, that there would be new things that are, that are taking place, that are being grown in our lives. And it's with that back, background that we come to verse 25. And in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 25, the first word of that verse is therefore. And so what Paul is saying to us, what Paul would be teaching us this morning is because we have a belief that there is something new that's going on, therefore, there is a change that's taking place. And so let's look at what these changes, there are three in particular that we're going to see this morning, these changes that should be taking place in our life. Verse 25 says, Therefore, each of you must put, us, put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. Paul talks about here that... There we go. Uh, that in these strongholds in our lives, one of the strongholds that, that we can have is not truth, but instead of who we are called to, to be, this new self that we have, instead so often we allow lies to guide who we are. Have you heard any lies this week? Think back. Have you ever thought that you knew what was going on, perhaps what a situation was, what was taking place, and only to find out later it wasn't all of, of what you thought it to be. From the very beginning, from the very beginning, Satan has been attacking us. Satan has been attacking God's creation and saying, you can't really trust God. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1, Satan is speaking to Eve, and he comes to her and says to her, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? He came right to her and, and directly addressed a truth that God had spoken. Because he had said, you can eat from any tree, any tree in the garden. There's all kinds of trees. There's all kinds of fruit. But from this tree, from this tree, I'm asking you not to eat. Trust me in that. I'm asking you not to eat of this tree. And yet Satan went right to that truth, went right to that truth and wanted to replace it with a lie. Did God really say that? He still comes to us every day. Today you're going to hear that. You maybe heard that on your way to church. You perhaps heard that even since you've been here. Because Satan's a liar. And he will cause us to question, did God really say that? Did God really say that? The default of our flesh, the default of our flesh is to question, is God really good? Is God really good? Are the things that he's that he's taught us in his word, and we're going to see this throughout this morning, are the things that he taught us, are, is, that, is that really what he meant when he told me that? Is that really what he meant? 
Lies are, a, are an attempt of Satan to strangle the truth, to strangle it. He doesn't want us to hear the truth of God's word. Lenski puts it this way, truth is reality, and every lie is a fiction, a pretended reality that asserts that something is so when it really is not so at all, or that something is not so when it really is so. A pretended reality. Truth is reality. And in our daily walk, the battle that we face is, will we, will we buy into the pretended reality that we're being told, that we're hearing from the world, from Satan? And there's also this, we're going to talk about it this morning, there's still that flesh within me, that traitor that lives within me, that's Brad. I know I'm speaking in the third person now about myself, but there's also that that part of that lives within me that still wants to say yeah but but i know what's best i I know that's what god said but but did he really mean it to apply today did he really mean that to apply for me now paul says that these lies not only affect me but they also affect me and my relationships with others so in playing that out it affects the church it affects those that are around us the end of that verse says Speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. As we hear lies, as we repeat lies, as we buy into lies, that not only affects my life, that affects those that are around me. It affects my wife, affects my son, affects the people that I go to church with. It says that we're all a part of one body. And so even the things that I buy into, in the end, come back not only to get me but it also can affect the people that are around me it can affect the church in general and as it affects the church in the big picture it's also going to affect the people that that we live and work around are, have we bought into lies within our culture or within our church that affect those that are around us paul says be very careful be very careful those things that we are tempted to listen to to hear to follow after Be on the alert for them. Be careful. Don't let them have a stronghold in our life. We are called to live in truth. We are called to seek for truth. Second, the next stronghold that that Paul talks about is not only the lies that we can hear, but also the anger or the bitterness that we can experience. Look at verses 26 and Verse 27, it says, In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Paul's referring to an anger that leads to sin. Often the question might be, well, am I never supposed to be angry? Look at, there are two examples here in in the verses that are to come of of an anger that leads to a sin, and then we see God's anger as well in in the coming verses. Look first at verse 31. Paul says, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. As opposed to, if you go on just a little bit further into chapter 5 and verse 6, Paul says, Let no one deceive you with empty words, He's speaking about lies. Okay, don't listen to lies. For because of such things, God's wrath comes on those that are disobedient. So here, again, he's talking about anger in both of those those verses. One in which the things that that are controlling me, I'm holding on to them, I'm carrying them, I'm making it about me being in the center of what's taking place. And the second example that we have there in verse 6 God's seeing the lies that are being said that are being perpetuated and that it's it's deceiving others it's drawing other people astray and it says that he expresses anger towards that have you felt angry recently have you felt that well up within your soul I need to tell you about a narrative that I believe that's often 
that fact that I believe that everything centers around me. You ever feel that way? Not that everything centers around me, but that everything centers around each one of us? Sally, I see you laughing. No, I tend to think that everything centers around me and that those that I engage with can be found worthy of not only my agenda, that's where it starts. I have an agenda of how I believe life is going to play out. So not only are they worthy of being in my agenda, but when things don't go the way I have planned them, they're also worthy of my wrath. They're also worthy of my anger. There's my world, my priorities, and my default is fairness. Fairness as I define it. A justice for others and not necessarily for myself. Last two weeks, that's become very apparent to me. God has brought that to the forefront of my mind as I've dealt with specifically my wife and my son. As I went into an agenda that I had, things that I expected to be done at a certain time and in a certain way, and when they didn't turn out that way, it wasn't just an anger that, or disappointment that things weren't happening on my schedule. They were slowing me down. They were keeping me from being somewhere and getting something done, all on my agenda. And I was sitting on, on, the, on the bench right by, by the door waiting to go outside in one particular instance. And man, God said, what are you angry about? You're angry about you. You're angry about your schedule. How often do I let those things that are perhaps over minor things in, in the terms of the agenda of what I want to see take place, how often do I let that form a barrier or a wall between me and my family, me and my, my work in my workplace, me and the places where I work or in the places where I go? Now, I will concede, I was, I was one, once told... Dishes need to soak. Okay, have you ever heard that phrase before? Dishes need to soak. Sometimes there's stuff that, that's, uh, that's stuck there on the plates and you got to let them sit in the water. And sometimes, yeah, it, it's good to let your anger perhaps set a little bit. Maybe, maybe let it go overnight. But, but what is Paul talking about when he says in verse 7, don't, well, at the end of verse 6, don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Don't give the... Don't give the devil a foothold. Yeah, maybe sometimes you need to let the sun go down. You need to, to, to evaluate, is it about me, is it about them, or is it something that I really need to hold on to? But man, if, if we got anger towards others, how quickly, right? How quickly does that become bitterness? How easily can that become resentment? Man, Go and talk to those individuals. That's what I believe Paul is saying here is when you feel those things, and you will, right? And you will. You're going to feel it this week. You're going to feel it perhaps today. We need to be keeping short accounts. We need to be talking to others about that. We need to be starting by looking at and, and talking to the Holy Spirit and saying, is it just my agenda? Are these the things that God's calling me to, to, to really disrupt my life and be angry about? Or is this just because you're not having things happen when you expect them to happen is it just a schedule that you have and the world's supposed to revolve around you because when we don't deal with it when we do let it sit it does become bitterness and and in particular paul says it becomes a foothold for the devil remember he's talking to the church he's talking to believers and he says the devil can get a foothold in your life we're going to come back to that in just a moment we're going to come back to that in just a moment. But we see the stronghold of lies. We see the stronghold of anger. And then in verse 28, Paul goes and, and ta has to talk about our finances. Look at that. Verse 20, 28, anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those that are in need. I started out as I read that, and in fact, the first draft that I gave to, to Carol in this outline, I had uh, um, theft. I had stealing down there. And in my own heart, as I looked at that and I thought about, about money, I thought, boy, good thing that's, he's not talking about me there, right? I'm not stealing. I'm not 
taking things from others that I shouldn't. I'm working hard, right? That's what the first verse is, the first part of that verse is about. He is speaking to the fact that we are called to, if we have the energy, if we have the, the ability to, to do something, we're called to work with our hands. We're not called to be lazy. He is speaking to that. But as I, I read that and I, I kind of let that set in my head, I, I realized there, there's, there's a second half to that verse as well. What's it say at the second half of verse 28? Look at that. It says that we must work doing something useful with their hands with this last phrase, that they may have something to share with those in need. Yes, we're called to an honest day work, but how often do I think what's mine is mine? I earned it. If they want that, why don't they go earn it? Why don't they go do it? Why aren't they working harder? They don't deserve this. They can go out and work like I do. If I get a raise, that raise is for me. In one of the commentaries uh, by uh, William McDonald, he says this, and this is the part that got me. In speaking of verse 28, this is radical and revolutionary. The natural approach is for us to work for the supply of our own needs and desires. When our income rises, our standard of living rises. Been there? <laughs> uh, I was a little too close to home for me. When my, st when my income rises, my standard of living rises. Everything in our lives revolves around self. This verse suggests a nobler, more exalted view of secular employment. Wow. Why has God blessed us? He had to provide for us. We're going to look at that a little bit more here in just a moment. But he's also blessed us so that we might bless others. What does that look like? What do you have to share with those that are in need? Think about that. What do we have to share with those that are in need? That can be a stronghold. The lie that I can believe is that what has been given to me is for me. And yet God says, no, it's not just for you. I'm blessing you to be a blessing to other people. I was challenged recently with the fact of if God gave you a million dollars, would that be a burden or a blessing? My first instinct is, yeah, let's try it, right? <laughs> let's, let's see what might happen. But man, as I read this verse and I, and I really start to think about the motives of my heart, it wouldn't be a blessing. I mean, it would be for about this long. It would be a blessing for me, but would it be a blessing for anyone else? I don't know. I got to be honest with you, I, I think I would start thinking of how I'm going to get a new vehicle, or what am I going to remodel in my home, or man, my shoes, they need replaced, not by the ones that I already have at home. Oops, can I go backwards? Oh, man, I'm learning. Through lies, bitterness, and stealing, through seeing my finances as only being for me, Satan can get a can get a foothold. Satan's talking, or God's talking about the fact that Satan can have access points to have footholds or strongholds in our lives. Footholds don't just start, they might start as footholds, but they don't stay there. They continue to grow. A, strong, a foothold turns into a stronghold. And a stronghold, as we know, is a fortress. We begin to make room for things that in our Christian life we weren't intended to have. We make space for things God never intended us as believers to carry along with us. To give our life to Christ is to submit to his authority. And when a believer does that, the Holy Spirit comes to live within them. And yet, here Paul says it's possible for us to give permission, to give authority to the devil or to evil spirits or whatever you want to call it that we were never intended to do as disciples. We don't often talk about that because then it's like, well, you mean, are you possessed by Satan or are demons in them? Or I'm not going into those kind of things. I'm saying... 
when you give your life to Christ, you have the Holy Spirit that lives within you. And yet Paul says that footholds can be created in our lives that give authority, that give space where space was not intended to be. And with that in mind, I want to point us to a couple of other scriptures that talk about the battle that's waging within us. Because not only are there strongholds for lies or for truth, for, for anger or for bitterness, for selfishness or for generosity, but our flesh is at war with, with the spirit that is to have control over us. In Galatians chapter 5, and we're going, to look at a couple, we're going to look at a couple verses here. You can turn there if you'd like. It's just a couple pages back um, there in your Bible. In Galatians 5, verses 16 through 17, Paul says to the Galatians, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict, or they do battle with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. Man, when is the last time the world told you that last sentence? That there's a flesh within you, there's desires within you, and there's the Holy Spirit that lives within you as a believer. They're in contrast with one another, and we can't just do whatever we want to do. We're in submission to the Father. We're called to live under his authority. I can't do whatever I want to anymore. He's my master. Verses 24 and 25 go on. Those who belong to Jesus Christ, or to Christ Jesus, have crucified the flesh. Right? When we give our lives to Christ, he died on that cross on our behalf. We've crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit... Let us keep in step with the Spirit. Since you have the Holy Spirit that lives within you, now as we work that out, as we live that out on a day-to-day -day basis, let that come out. Man, the things that want to come out of me, sometimes it's of, of who God is, but again, my default tends to be I want to do what I want to do. I want to be in the center. I, I want to be the one in charge. The flesh and the Spirit wage war. There is a kingdom battle that is taking place within each one of us each and every day. Where are our priorities? Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, says this in Matthew 6, verses 32 to 33. For the pagans, or in our context here, I'm going to say the flesh, for the flesh runs after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. What are these things that Jesus is talking about? Well, in the verses preceding that, he's talking about wealth, and then he's talking about specifics like clothes, food, and shelter. And Jesus says, the world seeks after them. They run after those things. Our flesh desires them. I know that's as true in my life as it is in yours. And it says here that, that God knows that you need those. He knows that we need those things. Look where he says he wants to start, verse 33. It says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. If you were to sit down and write your priorities for life and be completely honest, just with you sitting there, which is number one? I like to put God on that first line, don't we? I, I, that's where I want to put them. It's easy for, though, for me to write my family or for me to write ministry or for me to write a whole bunch of other things at different times, right? Maybe depending on the day. He says, when you put kingdom things first, when you put his kingdom first, he says, all those things that you desire, I'm going to give back to you. But he says, trust me. Put my kingdom first. Allow me to teach you. Right? This, not me to teach you. He says, allow his spirit to teach you what that looks like. You don't have to run to me and say, well, Brad, is, is, how does this priority look like compared to and fit in there? Yeah, I'm, I might be able to give you feedback and ideas or direct you one way or another, but as you talk to the Holy Spirit who lives within you, he will guide you. 
He says, when you put kingdom things first, all the other things fall into place. All the other things fall into place. That stretches my faith. How about you? Doesn't it? Because I know what I want. I know what I need. I know when I need it. And yet he says, wait on me. Trust me in these things. All these things that I might do to put me back into the center, even those good things, right? Not just the lies, the anger or bitterness and my finances, but family, ministry. He calls us to surrender those to him. And we can trust him to provide and give those things back to him just as he intends. Praise the Lord, not only is there a battle, but we're also told about the victory. I go through too quickly. There it is, the victory. Go back to Matthew chapter 16, and we're going to uh, close in, in in these verses. So turn with me back to Matthew 16. In Matthew 16, Jesus is speaking with the disciples. And as they were walking along, Jesus asked his disciples this, who do people say that the Son of Man is? A lot of people have been talking about who Jesus was. Was he just a good prophet? Was, was he a heretic? Was he just another rabbi or Pharisee? Who do people say that I am? The disciples responded. Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, other, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Jesus says, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? To which Peter piped up and answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. He says, you're the Messiah. You're the one that we've been told about. You're the Savior, right? When you're in a battle, you want a Savior. You want a hero to come along and and be a part of the victory that takes place. And, And Peter identifies Jesus as being the Savior, the Messiah. Jesus responds and says in verse 17, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood but by my father in heaven he says that in and of yourself you wouldn't know that to be true but as you've as you've seen me walk here on earth as you've seen the miracles as you've heard the teaching god's revealed to you the fact that i am the savior and then he says this verse 18 and i tell you that you are peter and on this rock i will build my church and the gates of hades will not overcome it Jesus says that he's going to build his church and he's going to build it on the fact that he is the Savior, that he is the only one, that his kingdom will come and that we are called to put it first. I've always thought it interesting, that last phrase, the gates of hell will not overcome it. In my mind, when I've read that or seen that phrase, I've always thought about the fact of here's heaven and it's got the pearly gates on the front right do you see you have have you seen that picture in your mind before heaven with the pearly gates and here comes hell and it's attacking heaven and i can be confident from this verse that hell is not going to be able to overcome heaven that's what typically comes to my mind now if you put that into practical application you would also believe that satan is attacking heaven with gates right it says that the gates of hell will not overcome in that the gates of hell will not overcome it. So I guess if Satan is attacking heaven, he's coming with the gates and he's, and he's ramming up against them. Just in the last month, I was listening to, to a guy speak and he says, no, strongholds have gates. Strongholds have gates. If you have a fortress, you have a way in and out of that. And he says, he said, when Jesus said that the gates of hell will not overcome it, come it, he was talking about the fact that heaven, believers, can attack strongholds, can attack where Satan has gotten permission to do the things that he's not allowed to do. And that when we come at him in the power of the Holy Spirit, the gates of hell can't stand against that. Me, in and of myself, I'm not strong enough. In my flesh, in who I am, in and of me, I'm not strong enough to overcome the things that that Satan wants to do in my life or in the life of others. But he says, and he goes on to say, that he's given us keys to the kingdom. 
I will give you, in verse 19, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. He says, I'm going to give you victory. If you're going to a stronghold, if you want to go through the gates, if you want to have freedom from the from the addictions, from the sin, from the strongholds that we have in our lives. He says, I have a key for you that will unlock that door. He says, and in the power of the Holy Spirit, the the places where you give the Holy Spirit freedom to work, he says, you're going to experience victory. And in the places where you say, you know what, I got this. I got this. I'm going to try harder. I can get this figured out. He says, I'm not going to push through that. He says, I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom. I want to work in and through your life. When you allow me freedom, when you give me permission to attack those strongholds, there is victory. There is victory. James talks about the same thing in James chapter 4, verses 4 and following. James says, you adulterous people, By the way, he's talking to believers here. So if he's calling us adulterous people or he's calling the church that he's writing to adulterous people, it's because they say that they're in love with God and yet they're sleeping with somebody else. That's what adultery is, right? I'm in a a marriage relationship and I choose to go outside of that to find fulfillment. That's how James describes the people that would have been reading this. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity or strife against God, battling against God. Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. And check out this verse. I I put it on your overhead, on the overhead for you in verse 5. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the Spirit that he has caused to dwell dwell within us? And he's given us the Holy, Holy Spirit he calls us out as being adulterous. And he says, don't you know that like a spouse that wants his, his, his partner to come back to him, that he jealously longs for, you, for us to be wholly committed to him, right? Verse 6, he gives us more grace. He doesn't go and divorce us. He doesn't go and throw us to the side because of the things that we've done. It says, what does he do? He gives us more grace. This is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Verse 7, submit yourself there then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning, and your joy to gloom. And then verse 10, Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Man, he says, even though you might have run away from him, even though I'm the adulteress, I'm the one that is, the spirit lives within me, and yet I want the things of the world, I'm looking to those things to please me. He says, when you come back and you humble yourself before him, he, he receives you, he forgives you, he gives us victory in those areas. Man, if that's you this morning, as, as the Spirit's been talking to you, there's hope. He calls us to confess. Confess is what we do out loud when we say, this is what I've done. Repentance is going to the one that can forgive us, is going back to him and praying and saying to our Heavenly Father, this is how I've behaved. These are the things that have become a stronghold in my life. Man, I, I want to I knock down those walls. I want to go through those gates. I want to give you freedom to clear out that area. And then surrender. Confess, repent, surrender. Is that part? Fill that area. Right? If we don't fill that with things that are that are filled with him, the truth of his gospel, something else is going to fill it in. Something else is going to fill it in. It always does. So not only do we go and and do we take authority in those strongholds in our lives, we give them, we surrender them to our Heavenly Father and give Him permission to fill those. Man, if if that's you this morning, 
We want to pray with you. We want to encourage you. We want to walk with you as you go through these things in your life. This is what God has called us into, it says, as a church, that we can have victory, that we can go against strongholds and see that. That's not just for certain people. That's for believers. That's for disciples who have said, Lord, I I want you to have my life. And that's the battle that we've seen that that Paul has been talking about as we've been going through these verses is that we all have those places. We all have doors that we've opened up and, and given Satan at times a foothold. And those footholds have turned into strongholds. Man, but he wants to end that. He wants to end that today. I'm going to call the worship team up, and they're going to lead us in a, in a, closing, in a closing song. It's all about going free. And, uh, man, if God's been laying on, that on your heart, if there's a stronghold that he's been talking to you about even this morning, I invite you to come up here in the front row and, and have a seat. Uh, our prayer team would love to come and pray with you. Myself or others perhaps would come and, and, and pray with you to, to give you encouragement, to offer you hope. I believe in that verse that says that hell can't stand up against what God wants to do. Not because of anything I can do in my human self, but because of what the Holy Spirit wants to do. Will you lead us in our closing song?